Man's Bake Company was born um, in the valley uh, in the mid-50s. He would make his own lures, and he'd give them to the other fishermen to try. And it became so popular that he started making more money off of his lures than he was as a conservation officer. And it grew and grew, and uh, they decided to move the family to Enterprise, Alabama, where he built Man's Bake Company. And they employed about probably 25 women. And together they would make the lures and he would go out and fish tournaments to promote the lures while mother would stay behind and run the company. In the late 60s, dad decided that he would fish a tournament hit in Eufaula, Alabama. And he won the tournament. He fell in love with the beautiful town and decided to move the family here and the business. It grew and grew to about 150 employees. And then after a while, he started working on a a depth finder. In the early 70s, Dad met a man named Steve Fulton. He had been working on a depth finder. Dad had a lot of knowledge of the depth finders through his fishing, and he and my Uncle Don Mann, his brother, decided that to come up with a depth finder of their own. And the first one was called the Super 60. It brought in a man named Yank Dean who became the president of the company and dad the vice president because he was so busy with Man's Bait Company. Today they employ hundreds of people and the units are sold all over the world. The first job I had was at Mr. A. Lockwood's grocery store. And back then, in the grocery stores, you could the clerk would, I mean, the, the patient would, the customer would tell you what they wanted and you would go and get it and put it up there. And then you'd add up whatever they wanted, whatever they desired, and that was the way it worked. Went to work on Saturday at, I, I've forgotten, 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, working until 12 o'clock at night. I got a dollar. When, when I started in the insurance business, they didn't have a homeowner's insurance. We wrote the insurance policy out here. They sent us blank insurance policies. And we would type them up here. I, I was in a partnership with Jimmy Clark from the time I started until 1980. You know, Avondale Mill started as an industry for you all. Of course, they could, didn't make, couldn't make it. And Donald Coleman won in that here and bought it. He bought it, interest in it. He wanted to add on to it. The board of directors voted him down. He said, okay, said, we're going to have a board meeting next month. And either we're going to expand or buy the new equipment, or we're going to get a new board. Growing up in New Fowler was wonderful. Our parents could let us walk to the theater at night. We played out all of the bunch. There was nothing to fear here. Everybody got along. We skated in the streets, and one lady took great joy every time she would see us calling the police, and we would see them coming and hide in the bushes. And when they would leave, we'd go back out, skate some more. But see, when I was growing up, we had two theaters there, skating rinks, everything. Had perfectly wonderful dress shops, good restaurants, only we called them tea rooms. And we just had everything here. And you follow, I guess, was a town of about 5,000. And most all of us who grew up here, our families went back several generations. And I will admit, we didn't care about new people coming in, not me, because I was a child, 
but the town didn't care about new people coming in. They were satisfied with the quota as it was. The biggest business in New Fowler was Coyote Mills, owned by the Comas. And, and the biggest jump was a good many years later when Meade came in. That upped the price of the workers. I was selling real estate at that time. In fact, I was the second woman in New Fowler to ever sell real estate. I would go over to the people that wanted to buy a home, and I would be amazed how much they paid the floor sweepers. But that is the jump in New Fowler on wages. But I'll have to say that Cabby Mills, they really took care of their employees. They were all like one big family. Cag Mill was, was for years and years, that, that was the industry in New Fowler. And really and truly, they didn't care about getting anybody else here. There have been a lot of changes in New Fowler, but there's, there's a lot that has not changed. I have seen it come from dirt roads to pavement. I have seen it change from I knew everybody I saw, the family history, and even the cooks and the dogs' names. Now, when you go around, I believe there are more people I don't know than people I do know. But you knew everybody. But that has all changed. Because we don't have a bowling alley, we don't have a skating rink, we don't have theaters. We, we had little mom and pop grocery stores, Jitney Jungle, and my grandfather had a, a grocery store on what we call Wall Street. It's known as South Eufaula, but that was Wall Street. And Neil Lowe Company had a little store on that street. I love it here, though, and there's no way I'd rather go. I was born here and I'm going to die here. See, I was born in 20. And I have seen many a change and many a person not here. And on the day April the 26th was Confederate Memorial Day. And oh goodness, we would have parades. Miss Jenny Dean and some of them and that. Cadillacs would be in that parade and almost would shut uh, down, down. That was a big, big day. I went in the Air Force in 1961, after graduation from school. Spent time in Lackland Air Force Base, Keesler Air Force Base, studying electronics, and come to Eufaula in 1962. I spent four years at Eufaula Air Force Base uh, working in the uh, radar maintenance division. The significance of the radar base in Eufaula, it was uh, started out as an experimental base. It was uh, radar that the contractors had proposed and they had put in about 10 different sites in the southeast of the United States. All the information from the radar was sent to MOADS, which was M-O-A-D-S, Montgomery Air Defense Sector. And then it was all sent to NORAD in Colorado. We had about 120 enlisted personnel at the base with five, maybe six officers. So it put a great amount of economic influence in Eufaula. Uh, the meals, a lot of it was purchased here in Eufaula that we had at the base, some very good meals. Um, the construction started in probably 1953. It was officially opened in 1958. I came in 1962 and 
spent four years here. The radars that we had, one was search, a search radar set, the big one, and then the one that was in the bubble was a height finder, and that was the one that I worked on. Maintenance, keeping it up, keeping it operational. The radar base in Eufaula closed in 1968. Uh, the particular reason, I guess, I don't really know uh, whether the radar had been already outdated or it just, as we said, it was experimental. And uh, things improved. After my enlistment ended in the United States Air Force, we moved to Eufaula in 1969. I started to work at Alabama Craft, which is the paper mill between Eufaula and Phoenix City, Alabama. We had one machine. We made a brown board without the coating. The coating had not been added yet. And we transported the paper. Most of it went to Atlanta where it was then coated and then made into the boxes that you see now. Over the years I saw many improvements. They added the second paper machine. They added a recycle department who took the recycled paper and uh, made it back into the good paper that you see. Uh, eventually they added the second machine with the coder on it, which probably doubled almost the capacity of the paper that we made. Also increased the employee count, but uh, I have seen many improvements out there and the the, the wood that you see running up and down the road on the trucks goes out there. It's chipped, cooked, strained, and comes out on the paper machine as a sheet of paper. Because of the adding of the other paper machine, other areas had to be increased in size as well. The wood handling capabilities, the... Uh, Shipping department had to be increased because we, we started out with about four people in the shipping department and it's up to about 10 per shift now. So we handled close to about 3,000 ton of paper in a day that we made and shipped. If it wasn't shipped right then, it was stored for a while. And that was uh, helped by adding the IWS warehouse, which really was not a part of Mead. It's a separate company that handles a lot of the paper that they make out there. They, they sheet and will retrim rolls into a size that the customer uh, wants. Chamber had already declared itself in, uh, in 1990 that they wanted to become the Eufaula Barber County Chamber of Commerce rather than just Eufaula. So we began the process for the next several years of trying to make this happen. So with some leaders in the uh, officers and core of the chamber at that time, we began the process. We did things like going to every community in the county, talking to the mayors and the leaders of the government there, and we began to go into the churches in the county and talk with them about what could happen if we all worked together and to create jobs and make this truly a countywide effort. And it was not easy at first, but we began to get some real success. Well, there was real leadership on the part of uh, previous mayors and previous city councils here, and also Representative Clark and others at the state level. They were able to successfully bring in companies like American Buildings, which is a large uh, operation in Eufaula, and they would also 
begin to uh, work on the uh, efforts that Mr. Tom Mann had done when he was living and when he started his bait company and he started fishing on Lake Fall. So we had Texonics and uh, several of the bait industries that set up shop here. We also had some traditional uh, uh, cotton mill operations here. Uh, the Japanese company invested a great deal here in TNS mills, and uh, we had several that were already here uh, operating quite successfully. And Eufaula and Barber County experienced uh, the loss of several sewing factories that had been a mainstay for people for many, many years. Because of that loss in uh, jobs in the area, the unemployment rate gradually began to rise. And when I came here, the unemployment rate had risen to about 13%. Now that's a lot of people in this county. In fact, there were several uh, state publications that came out at that time and said that uh, the Counties, about 15 counties in the state had more people on welfare than there were jobs available in the county, and Barber County was one of those. So with that kind of setting, uh, we began to think about what could we do differently and what could we do next as far as creating some jobs. So we began setting up a plan to uh, try to attract a company that would come in and set up a complete poultry operation. And they use the term uh, complete integrated poultry operation. And, and so I realized what that meant could have a tremendous impact because it had about four or five or six components. So we had to look at several different locations where these uh, operations could take place in our county. And we began to work with uh, people at the Alabama Development Office in Montgomery, with the Alabama Power Company, with the Southeast Alabama Gas District, and make them know, and we made them know, that we were seriously interested in securing a poultry operation. When we began our contacts with the officials from uh, Thailand, very fortunately, the vice president of their entire operations in Bangkok, Thailand, had a reasonably good uh, command of English. So we were able to communicate quite well with him. He had, he'd always have a, an interpreter with us many times when we would meet with him and talk with him. But we began to work with a person by the name of Mr. Siri Chong Chan. He was the vice president of the company in Thailand, and he had been assigned to develop this project in the United States. We became very good friends, and we're still good friends today. I think what this is really saying is that we, in order to get the company to commit to us, we had to know as much as we could about them, and they had to know as much as they could about us and about this county and this area back in, 1995 uh, uh, that we, we, we started it. We were really kind of we were making some progress and that we might land this company. We ran into some problems. And, and let me digress in a minute and say, you, in order to develop a program like this, you have to have all of your political leaders on the same page with you. And that was something that we worked at on a constant basis. And that's why that first two years of developing a countywide effort was helpful to us. You also have to have the uh, uh, people in the area on board with you. We tried to educate the people as much as we could that, you know, what this would be and what it would mean, the ups and downs of it. And then we began working with the bankers because the bankers had to be heavily involved in this thing in order to finance what would turn out to be over a hundred farmers in this area that would initially be needed to begin raising chickens. And those farmers would have to finance their own houses that they would build on their property. He 
each house would probably cost anywhere from a half to three quarters of a million dollars. So they would have to have some loans in order to make this happen. The company that we were working with, of course, initially in economic development, you just don't know who it is. You just send a proposal to them. But we realized it was the, the, had the name of Sheroen Pofkin. And we shortened that, and they uh, went along with that, CP. So CP became on the tongues of a lot of people in this area. This was a company out of Bangkok, Thailand, that we were working with. Uh, CP was, Shiroi and Popcam was a part of a much larger or organization that had branched out into all kinds of industrial areas and had plants all over the world. At that time, this poultry uh, branch of the CP branch was probably the second or third largest poultry company in the world. They said up front that they would probably spend 150 to $200 million of their own dollars to build this plant. And they would want all the grants that we could get for them, but they would invest it themselves because so they were serious about it. So when we finally uh, got their go ahead, we began one of the harder parts of the thing, and that is to select a location for each of these operations and to get that moving. We finally <clears throat> decided that we would have one of their uh, operations here in the city of Eufaula, and we would put the, the hatchery in the industrial park in Eufaula, and uh, we would then <clears throat> set up the uh, slaughtering operation, the processing plant, in the little town of Baker Hill. One of the real challenges was to find enough land in the Baker Hill area for the operation. Many people wanted to work with us on, the, on that, but uh, we had to have adjoining land, and we had to work with two or three different people. And I want to say that some of the landowners in that area were very cooperative with us, and uh, the site that was selected uh, required the land from several people and uh, they were cooperative with us in order to, to make that happen. What we found that once the uh, plant became operational in that first year, the unemployment rate, which is, had been varying between 11 and 13 percent for quite a while, unemployment rate began to come down. And uh, I always like to made a lot of speeches to report that the unemployment rate was down to 3%. And I think today, the economic impact of the operation of uh, CP originally, and now it's the company that owns it now, is having a, and will have a continued impact on this area.